Friends, welcome to the latest session of our course, The Introduction to the Qur'an. Today we're coming to you from the Masjid An-Nur in South Bend, Indiana, or the Islamic Society of Michiana. It's a great honor to be here, and we're here as guests of the Imam Muhammad Sirajuddin. The topic of today's session is, in particular, the revelation of the Qur'an. And we're going to explore with Imam Muhammad questions of how Muslim tradition sees the process by which the Qur'an became a text, that is, how it came from God, from heaven to earth. So, welcome, Imam Muhammad. Thank you, it's my pleasure you it's know, an to honor. be part of it. It's so, an honor to have you with us. Thank you, thank you. it's my pleasure. So. Why don't we enter right into this question of the revelation of the Qur'an. Um, I thought we might begin simply by discussing generally from your perspective, how Muslims see how the Qur'an, as I just mentioned, how it became a book that was in heaven to a book that's on earth. How would you present this question? Uh, this is a good time. Today and tonight is considered the night in which Qur'an either entirely or just started to uh, come down to, uh, to our world through Angel Gabriel to on the heart of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it was uh, more than 1400 years ago when Prophet Muhammad uh, started uh, going to the cave of Hira in the mountain of uh, Jabal An-Nur, the mountain of uh, light. Like and we're in Masjid An-Nur, yeah. the mosque of light. Yeah, that's true. Yes. So in Jabal An-Nur, in the cave of Hira, he was uh, meditating and asking the questions uh, that generally every serious human being asks in their life that, you know, what are we doing here? What is our destination? And what is the meaning of life? And why are we here in this world? So one day when he was spending days and nights in Ghar Hira, cave Hira, so he, the angel Gabriel, archangel, appears to him and embraces him, hugs him, and squeezes him and asks him that read. And he says that uh, I am not a reader. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to read. Because by uh, um, tradition he was illiterate. He wasn't yes. able to read. Mm -hmm. He wasn't able to read. And there is a wisdom in that, uh, that so that people cannot accuse him that he learned from this you know, school or from this uh, teacher. So God wanted him uh, to be illiterate so that he can, his heart is pure uh, from the outside influences. So when Angel Gabriel asks him to read, he says, Ma ana biqari. I am not a reader, I, am, uh, I don't know how to read. Then he uh, embraces him again and asks him the same question, that read, and then he repeats the same answer. The third time, Angel Gabriel, Gabriel, you know, he squeezes him and asks him the same question, and then he repeats the same answer. Then Angel, uh, the Archangel, starts uh, commanding him to read. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq, iqra wa rabbuka al-akram, alladhi allama bil khalam, allama al-insana ma lam ya'lam. That these are the five first verses reveal uh, in uh, Ghar Hira, Cave Hira, in the mountain of uh, light, which says that read in the name of your Lord, uh, who is most generous, who created things in this world, and who taught human being through the means of pen, and who taught him you know, what he did not know. And this, is, this today we find in chapter 96. In the yeah, Quran. that's true. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, this, is the, this is the beginning uh, verses of chaf chapter 96. Which is that's interesting true. for us because already it gives us some insight to the question of the chronology of the Quran. Mm -hmm. Because here we have the first revelation is not chapter 1 or yeah, Surah yeah, 1, it's yeah. Surah 96. And we'll speak yeah. about that um, in yeah. a moment. I wanted to ask about sort of the differentiation between two sort of stages or steps in the revelation of mm -hmm. the Qur'an. Because um, we have the Qur'an, in a sense, 
passing from God to the angel Gabriel, mm -hmm. and then passing from the angel Gabriel to, to Muhammad, to mm -hmm. the prophet. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe if we focus on that first step mm -hmm. a bit, um, I think the majority position is that the Quran is an internal book, is uncreated, mm -hmm. though there were some debates maybe in Islamic tradition about this in the past. That's true. Um, but could you speak a bit about that? Um, Different stages. Well, I, I mean, in particular, the idea that the Quran is an internal book, and then, and how did it go from from God to the angel Gabriel, according mm. to tradition? Uh, you know, when uh, Quran refers the book, it refers to the original book. Uh, that is also uh, the books that were revealed uh, previously to previous prophets, to uh, Moses, to Jesus, to Prophet Abraham. Uh, as well as uh, the final revelation, uh, which is uh, which came down in the form of Quran uh, that we have uh, today. Uh, so that book uh, was revealed from uh, the preserved tablet uh, from the uh, the seventh heaven to the lowest heaven uh, at one time, and then from there that book uh, started. Uh, being uh, sent down to Prophet Muhammad, Muhammad. on the night of uh, Al-Qadr. Which is... Uh, night of power, night of honor and decree. Yeah. And here in 2015, yeah. here in yeah. South Bend, yeah. where we're filming, is, yeah. is it's tonight. tonight. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Good time. <laughs> Good time. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me ask in particular about this phrase you use. You spoke about the preserved tablet. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that there were more than and more than just the Qur'an yeah, yeah. was sort of in this heavenly book. Yeah. Um, could you speak about this a bit more? So this means that um, the Qur'an has a special relationship, according to Islamic belief, with other books that were revealed before. That's true, that's true. You know, Qur'an is just a, uh, you know, latest version of God's guidance and the divine speech that God has been uh, sending uh, to mankind through, G, through the same angel, uh, Gabriel, uh, and through the same uh, media. Uh, and of Andrew, angel. Andrew yeah. Gabriel is yeah. my favorite angel, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's <laughs> why you named after. <laughs> uh, and, and you mentioned this tradition that from the preserved tablet, sort of the first step of revelation mm -hmm. on the night of Qadr, mm -hmm. was that God sent down the Qur'an from mm -hmm. the highest heaven to the lowest heaven. How should we imagine this? I mean, if you were to explain how Muslims understand this, mm. um, should we think of the angel Gabriel physically, sort of really traveling through the heavens with a physical book? Or should we think of this in spiritual terms? How would you speak of this? You know, this is from Alam al Ghaib. You know, this is the world of uh, unseen. Uh, this is the celestial world, uh, this cannot be comprehended, you know, understood uh, from the world that we live, from the things that we understand. Uh, but, you know, it talks to us in our own language in this world that he is taking from the seventh heaven, uh, Quran, and then bringing down to the lowest heaven. Uh, it is for us to understand, but we cannot know completely, you know, how it happened there. Mm. Uh, so this is completely from the uh, world of unseen, mm. you know, from the ghaib. So that's why it is faith. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was also then curious in pursuing mm. a bit more in investigation into this, the second mm. stage of revelation. So we spoke about how the Quran came from God to the angel Gabriel, mm -hmm. but then there's also the question of how it came from the angel Gabriel to the prophet Muhammad. Mm. Could you speak a bit about this? Okay. Um, did the angel Gabriel speak to him? Was it an audible voice according to Islamic tradition? Yeah, yeah. Was it a sort of inspiration? How should we understand there that? There is also? a long uh, the authentic tradition in the book of uh, Bukhari, in the book of traditions of prophet Muhammad uh, uh, That tradition talks about uh, the nature of uh, revelation in the chapter of revelation. Uh, it says that uh, Aisha, the uh, wife of Prophet Muhammad uh, uh, peace and blessings of God be upon him, she 
uh, narrates uh, about the wahi and she says that sometime it used to come uh, like salsalatul jaras like the uh, buzzing of bees or ringing of a bell uh, in that sound and sometime angel gabriel he would come in the form of a human being and bring that revelation and some uh, the of the companions who would be around during uh, the revelation they would feel that prophet muhammad uh, peace and blessings of god be upon him is sweating uh, and uh, he his voice uh, is uh, changing and he is breathing heavily during that time so there are physical signs on his uh, body uh, but again uh, it is uh, you know from uh, the ghaib from the unseen world so there are some physical elements you know to understand from it would us, almost you know. um, be evident to his companions and sort of show that he was going through this experience yeah revelation. that's true that's true and then you know that tradition says that you know that sound uh, would uh, you know convey uh, the verses of the quran and then he would uh, uh, he would memorize them and uh, you know and then uh, you know right after uh, the revelation uh, then he would call the people who would write uh, the revelation mm -hmm. and dictate them mm -hmm. uh, to make to sure they were preserved yeah. accurately yeah there's a quotation here that I wanted to read mm -hmm. to you and to see your reaction. This is from a Western scholar named Droz who translated the Quran. Mm -hmm. And in his introduction, in speaking about the revelation of the Quran, he says, in the digital age, mm -hmm. we're now in the digital age, in the digital age, we might liken it, that is this process of revelation, to the instant downloading of an e-book from a website to a computer's hard drive. What do you think about this metaphor? Is this a good? You know, metaphor? this is uh, this is good to again uh, for us to understand in the language, in the terminology that we uh, are very familiar in our time. Uh, but at the same time, these things are related to the uh, divine. Uh, so, the Quran is the uh, divine speech, the kalamullah. Uh, so, all the elements uh, doesn't have to match with this. Uh, you know, the example, metaphor, metaphor yeah. yes. Uh, but there is an element in this, you know, for us to make it easy to understand and mm -hmm. to yeah, grasp right. the nature of the wahi. Right. Um, another question that's interesting to me about this second stage of revelation, so about how the Quran came from the angel Gabriel to the Prophet Muhammad, is sort of the distinction between the Prophet's own inspired thoughts Mm -hmm. and the Qur'an itself. Because Islamic tradition tells us that not only did the Prophet receive Qur'an and proclaim the Qur'an as the Word of God, but also everything he said was in sense inspired. Maybe you can yeah, correct yeah. me or explain yeah, this yeah. a in, bit, right? In Surah An-Najm, you know, it says that uh, in huwa illa wahyun yuha, you know, uh, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى that he does not speak from his hava, from his desire, whatever he speaks, you know, it is from uh, God. Uh, but uh, not necessarily uh, it means that, uh, you know, God put words in his mouth uh, through the revelation as it is the case uh, in the, uh, in revelation, in the wahi of the Quran. Quran is worded completely you know, uh, from God, from the divine, mm. through Angel Gabriel, on the heart of Prophet Muhammad. And the other things he said, we would speak of them as, as Sunnah yeah. maybe, or Hadith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, but those two are somehow mm -hmm. um, a mirror or a reflection of God's will, according yeah. to Islamic tradition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, not, but not the words, or the, in the Prophet's not the, own not words. Not the is this exact words, English? yeah, yeah as it is uh, in case of Quran. Mm. And then the, uh, the question of authenticity, uh, you know, in Quran, it is more, uh, you know, preserved, and also it is considered the most authentic book uh, because it was recorded, it was memorized, it was preserved through the hearts of human beings as well as through uh, the form of mm. writings. 
So some people analyzing the Quran might notice that it tends to use, for example, figures of expression or turns of phrase mm -hmm. or examples or metaphors that are very close to the time and place in which the Prophet lived. So when it, it speaks of emthal or you know, yeah, parables, yeah. using um, something that would have been understandable, whether it's speaking about the desert or palm trees or um, the eye of a uh, needle and a camel, yeah, something yeah. we know from the Gospels as well. But it seems to be very much connected to the time and place the Prophet lived. It's not using examples, let's say, that would be familiar in China or New Zealand or someplace, someplace mm. far away. Um, does this mean we can speak of an element of sort of um, the Prophet's own involvement in the Qur'an, that he was expressing things in some ways, or he had a own mental participation in the text of the Qur'an? Or should we think of the Qur'an as um, closer to a dictation of the angel's words to the Prophet? Uh, it is the dictation of the angels of the Prophet, and God knows what language you know people would understand better uh, at the time. But those parables and examples, you know, they are uh, you know since the Arabs of Mecca, you know, they were the direct addresses of the Quran. So Quran uses those uh, the parables and examples. Uh, but at the same time, even in our time, they are understandable mm -hmm. and they are relevant for us too. So they have this sort know. of timeless quality, as you see. Yeah, yeah, way. yeah. For example, you know, the surah, uh, chapter of uh, Abasa, you know, in which Prophet is, uh, you know, told uh, to, you know, pay attention to one of the, one of his companions, you know, who happened to be blind and poor. Uh, so, uh, Prophet was told to pay more attention to him, mm. you know, because he is a sincere uh, Muslim. So here we see that it is a very timely incident that was addressed in this uh, chapter. But at the same time, you know, there is a lesson for us too in that. So yeah. I actually want to ask yeah. about this chapter in particular. I'll just yeah. read the English translation to okay. the first opening verses, okay. if that's okay. Yeah. This is from the translation of Talal Itani, which we're using for this course. Okay. So the first verses of uh, Surah Abbas. Abbasa, yeah. which is yeah. Quran number 80. Mm. You know, in, the, in the academy or in the West, we're used to yeah, numbering. Yeah, numbers, yeah. Yes. yeah. Usually, you know, uh, I was uh, trained uh, in the seminary in Madrasa, so we don't use usually numbers, we use names. Which is much more challenging, is yeah. to memorize all the names, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. maybe the text of the Quran <laughs> itself. Yeah, yeah. So the first three verses uh, tell us, or the first two verses, he frowned and turned away when the blind man approached him. And then we have the story about Ibn Umm Maktoum, yeah, this yeah. very specific story, which you already alluded yeah. to, who was a blind man, and the Prophet yeah. was speaking with one of the leaders of the Quraysh, and yeah, sort of yeah, yeah, turned yeah, away. Yeah. The question I wanted to ask is, this story is very specific, mm -hmm. um, and the revelation, or these verses revealed to the Prophet, speak about a very specific circumstance. And yet, Islamic tradition also tells us that the Qur'an is eternal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How do these two things go together? You know, that? in this specific uh, the incident, there is a, a universal uh, teachings uh, that are uh, given, uh, which is like in our time, it is uh, very relevant that, uh, you know, about racism, mm. the issue of racism that we are facing here, mm. that you should, uh, you know, you should not undermine uh, anybody who is not, you know, the same socio-economic uh, status. So in this case, yours. it's about a blind person, but yeah. it could be applied also to a yeah, race. Yeah, to our time too. I have another quotation, this mm -hmm. time from a Muslim, medieval Muslim scholar named Nasafi, mm -hmm. who's from the 12th century, yeah. which speaks generally about the revelation of the Qur'an. Um, thank you for being so patient with me. There's only thank a couple you. more, no, it's my pleasure. <laughs> couple more yeah. thoughts. Um, this is how Nasafi describes the revelation. I thought I'd read it to you and get your, okay. re your response or maybe your commentary on it. He says, God caused Gabriel to hear the Qur'an as sounds and letters, for he created sounds and letters and caused him to hear it by that sound in those letters. Gabriel memorized it, stored it in his mind, and then transmitted to the prophet by bringing down a revelation and a message, which is not the same as bringing down a corporeal object and a form. He recited it to the prophet. The prophet memorized it, storing up in his mind, 
and then recite it to his companions, who memorized it and recited it to their followers. It seems pretty close to the way yeah, you described yeah, the revelation. Yeah, that's true. Is there anything you'd comment yeah, about yeah. that or add to uh, it? No, I would uh, agree with that. You know, this is a very good uh, description. Mm-hmm. Great. Uh, well, there's one, one further stage, mm-hmm. which you've already alluded to in mm-hmm. traditions about the revelation of the Quran, which is, first the Quran comes, according to tradi- tradition, from God to the angel, and then from the angel to the prophet. Mm-hmm. But we actually have a third stage, right, where it comes mm-hmm. from the prophet mm-hmm. to his followers. Mm-hmm and those eventually who compiled the Qur'an. Because as you mentioned, um, the first revelation of the Qur'an is eventually not Surah 1, but Surah 96. Yeah, yeah. And the last revelation, there's some different traditions, but maybe yeah, Surah yeah. 9, a Tawbah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Nasr. So, um, or in Nasr 110, yeah, but yeah. not 114, not yeah. the final Surah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have um, these, these traditions then, um, but how should we see the way that the Qur'an took the shape it has now. How did the Prophet know, for example, he had one piece of Qur'an 96, Mm -hmm. the first five verses, but he didn't have the rest of it at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Uh, But eventually he got the rest of it, but Mm -hmm. in between he might have had some other revelations. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like pieces of a puzzle. He had a bit here, a bit here, a bit here. How would he know the correct order in which to put all of these pieces back together? You know, the uh, order of uh, the verses of the Qur'an as well as order of the chapters of Qur'an as they are, uh, you know, in our uh, time, that is considered uh, the tawqifi, means it is uh, from God, it is from uh, Angel Gabriel, and that he, uh, you know, dictated Prophet Muhammad uh, to uh, place such and such words in such and such uh, the chapter. Mm. Uh, so that's how Prophet Muhammad organized and uh, put the verses of the Quran in different chapters. And you know, uh, whenever a verse or verses were revealed, you know, he will uh, he, he was told he was told that you know put this verse you know before this verse after this verse in this chapter. So he was uh, completely, you know, commanded by uh, Angel Gabriel and from that, you know, from God. And tradition so, even tells us, I think that maybe once a year, is that right? They would, the yeah, angel once would visit a year, him? Or? Yeah, once a year, Angel would visit uh, Prophet Muhammad during the month of Ramadan and then uh, he would recite to uh, Angel Gabriel. So uh, we know that you know the present uh, order of the Quran. It is from the Prophet. It is from uh, the revelation. But there's a, a question which remains for me, which is: um, Is there anything sort of that we, as as human observers, we can perceive as special about this order? You see what I mean? Um, yeah, yeah. Does it matter that Surah Al-Baqarah, Quran chapter two, comes before Surah al Imran, yeah. Quran chapter three? And then, you know, Anisa comes afterwards. Does, does, does that matter? Is there, why did God want it in this order? I guess is another Yeah, way yeah. The, uh, you know, best answer for that is, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, he knows the complete wisdom of that. But many scholars have uh, tried to find the wisdom behind the present order of the Quran. Uh, why those chapters that are, you know, placed in the beginning of the Qur'an, why they are placed, what is the, uh, you know, wisdom behind it, and how they are related to the next chapters, and how the verses are related to each other. Uh, so this is another, you know, complete uh, different uh, topic in the Qur'an, nazm of the Qur'an. Some scholars and some commentators of the Qur'an, they, you know, focused more on that, uh, some not, uh, but uh, every, uh, one agrees that there is a wisdom behind the present order of the Qur'an. And even if we might not understand in detail that wisdom, yeah. something we, we could, uh, we Muslim could, we would honor, simply so. trust in God. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah that's right. Thank you. Uh, it's been an honor to have uh, the opportunity to speak with it's you here pleasure. at Masjid Anur yeah. and in a special season. So Ramadan blessings, Ramadan kareem. Thank you, thank you. And it's it was my an pleasure. honor. Thank yeah. you.